1954, the landmark Brown v. Board Supreme Court case declared that separate is not equal. To implement this ruling, the subsequent Brown II decision required schools to desegregate with all deliberate speed. From public locations to public schools, the Jim Crow South held to its deep-seated culture of segregation. In Charlotte, North Carolina, the advent of school integration would challenge its history of racial divides. From Dorothy Counts initiating desegregation in Charlotte schools to the implementation of busing after the Swan v. CMS litigation, a group of grassroots leaders galvanized a social revolution. Their efforts sparked local acceptance of desegregation and pioneered one of the most far-reaching methods for school integration, gaining Charlotte the reputation as the city that made desegregation work. Following the desegregation mandate, the South launched a massive resistance to school integration. Uh, schools were supposed to be separate but equal, said the Supreme Court, um, but in fact schools were separate and never equal. As one of the most residentially segregated cities in the U.S., with over 95% of blacks living in the northwestern portion of the city. Charlotte's broader social context of racial prejudice in the 1950s carried into the classroom. The idea here is that because our city um, was segregated along um, residential lines, it only um, exacerbated um, segregation within public schools, um, which is the term neighborhood schools com comes from um, the idea that you go to a school as close in proximity to where you live. Um, as a result of that, many children, um, many school children were going to schools that were primarily um, populated by students that looked just like them. Recognizing the inevitability of desegregation, in 1956, the North Carolina legislature passed the Purcell Plan as a moderate approach to integration. Consequently, during the summer of 1957, four students in Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, or CMS, were selected to set school desegregation in motion. On September 4, 1957, 15-year-old Dorothy Counts, one of these four students, walked alone as the first black student to integrate Harding High School. She faced a sea of white faces and picket signs as a mob surrounded the school. So as I was walking, uh, things uh, began to hit me in my back and I looked around it was sticks and there were ice and there were rocks and there was a lot of pushing and shoving. In contrast, the other three students successfully integrated their respective schools. Gus Roberts, who desegregated Central High School, later became the first African American to graduate from an all-white school in Charlotte. But despite this initial step towards school desegregation, the general community mobilized against integration. By her second day at Harding, Dorothy was ignored by her teachers, taunted by her peers, and received death threats. After four days, she withdrew from Harding High School. My father, he was the one who called the superintendent as well as the police chief and asked them and told them about the incidents that had happened over the last several days. And he said, I'm just trying to understand whether or not I can get a guarantee from you that my daughter's going to be safe in school and they said they couldn't guarantee that. While a pioneer in desegregating Charlotte schools, Dorothy's stand of solidarity would be overshadowed by the Little Rock Nine, who desegregated Central High School in Arkansas on the same day. Unlike Dorothy, who was unescorted by police or school administration, the Little Rock Nine integrated under the protection of federal troops issued by President Eisenhower. 
I think in some ways the fact that Dorothy Counts walked into that building unmolested without uh, a police guard accompanying her, as difficult as it was, as ugly as the confrontation was, um, was better than what you saw in Little Rock. And it is part of a narrative in which Charlotte becomes a city that does not exactly embrace the civil rights revolution, but is less hostile to it than most other places in the South. Dorothy's act of courage was widely syndicated in newspapers throughout the U.S. and the world, reaching the hands of Reverend Darius Swan. While a missionary stationed in India, he was unaware that he would later resume the fight for equal education in Charlotte. In the 1960s, the civil rights movement gained momentum on a national scale, escalating the fight for racial equality with efforts such as North Carolina's Greensboro Sit-ins, the March on Washington, and the Civil Rights Act of 1964. While the nation grappled with healing racial divisiveness, Charlotte began to reinforce integration, desegregating hotels and restaurants in 1963, and even electing the first African American to the Charlotte City Council in 1965. However, school desegregation remained stagnant. Ten years after the Brown decision, segregation was still the reality in Charlotte's classrooms. Of 109 total schools, 88 were segregated by race. Recognizing this disparity, a group of concerned parents prompted the landmark case, Swan v. the Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education. In 1965, Darius and Vera Swan incited the Charlotte NAACP to file a lawsuit against the school board after unsuccessfully attempting to transfer their eldest child to an integrated school from his assigned segregated school. Civil rights attorney Julius Chambers represented their case, trailblazing Charlotte's efforts to expedite school desegregation. A year prior, Chambers established the first integrated law firm in North Carolina. Garnering acclaim, he was approached by the Swans and other concerned parents to take up this case, progressing their argument against three key issues. Segregated school zones, inability to transfer into integrated schools, and segregation of school faculty. The objective was to have a school a uh, system with no school that uh, could be uh, racially identified as either black or white. When the case opened in 1965, the lower court ruled that freedom of school choice was an effective means of desegregation. However, by 1968, the Supreme Court overturned this precedent of choice in the Virginian school desegregation case Green v. Newcamp County. The decision contended that the Freedom of Choice Plan was not a sufficient step to effectively desegregate school districts. Seizing this opportunity to challenge Charlotte's previous ruling, Chambers refiled the Swan case to initiate a faster and more far-reaching desegregation plan. The case was tried under Federal District Court Judge James B. McMillan. Despite being a conservative judge, his decision would be a catalyst for school desegregation and civil rights in Charlotte. On April 23, 1969, Judge McMillan ruled that busing could be used as a mechanism for integration. McMillan's decision triggered the creation of the Concerned Parents Association, or CPA. The CPA prompted grassroots mobilization that organized protests and petitions against court-mandated busing. Some radical members even flooded Judge McMillan with death threats and burned him in effigy. Refusing to yield to popular demand, McMillan stood by his ruling, declaring that the rules of the game have changed, and the methods the school board has followed are no longer adequate. After iterations of contentious desegregation plans, including the board plan and the finger plan, the case was then appealed to the Supreme Court in the fall of 1970. Two months prior to the case being argued in the Supreme Court, the offices of attorney Julius Chambers were bombed. Despite this violent threat, Chambers was undeterred as he continued the stand against educational inequality at the highest judicial level. 
unanimous Supreme Court today affirmed the principle of busing school children to desegregate schools. The effects of this decision are almost incalculable. On April 20th, 1971, the Supreme Court unanimously upheld Judge McMillan's ruling. The decision shocked Charlottians. Despite initial opposition that arose from organizations such as the CPA, schools integrated at an unprecedented rate, and Charlottians adopted a sense of city pride in the advancement of educational reform. Busing strengthened the public schools, improved the racial climate, and ushered in a more effective and democratic era in the history of Charlotte. There had been previous desegregation orders nationally that said that you must desegregate. Right, but Swan was the first one that said, not only must you desegregate, but you can use and probably should use busing as a tool to do that. Thus marked Charlotte's golden age of desegregation, which became a national model of school reform. CMS's pioneering methods of integration inspired school districts across the country to adopt busing as a mechanism for desegregation. While busing was successful in Charlotte and beginning to take root in districts across the U.S., the system was opposed by the nation's highest executive authority. School busing has failed miserably. It has created bitterness, not eliminated it. On October 8, 1984, in a campaign visit to Charlotte, President Reagan claimed that Busing takes innocent children out of the neighborhood school and makes them pawns in a social experiment that nobody wants. Rebutting against his assertion on busing, the Charlotte Observer addressed Reagan in an open letter writing, You were wrong, Mr. President. Charlotte Mecklenburg's proudest achievement is not the city's impressive new skyline or its strong growing economy. Its proudest achievement is its fully integrated public school system. However, Charlotte's prosperous era took a sharp turn with the reopening of the Swan litigation. In 1999, a group of parents initiated the Capiccioni v. CMS lawsuit to reverse the busing order. District Judge Robert Potter declared that CMS was a unitary system, claiming the district had exercised all requirements to fulfill the Swan desegregation mandate. With this decision, decades defined by successful school reform were completely upended. Since the end of the busing era, Echoes of past school segregation are present in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools. The perpetuation of school choice plans and the neighborhood school model and the current CMS student assignment review mark a resurgence of the residentially segregated districting plans seen prior to the Swan litigation. Once heralded as the city that made desegregation work, Charlotte has fallen from its initial fight for educational equality. However, the efforts of Dorothy Counts and the frontrunners of the Swan v. CMS case serve not simply as a reminder, but as a lesson for a new generation of grassroots leaders who face the challenge to uphold the stand taken by Charlotte's pioneers.